All right, all right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We will get started in just a moment. I'm going to give people another 30 seconds to come in, and we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us tonight. As you come in, in the chat, please leave us uh, any messages, any hellos. If you see somebody you haven't seen in a while, give them a shout out. We're excited to have you join us today. All right, let's get started. Hello, welcome to students, colleagues, and community to another iteration of A&D Mondays, a weekly evening program featuring the ideas and people, the movement, and the artistic practices that most compel our Berkeley faculty, students, and staff. My name is Takia Jackson. And in light of the community goals of our program on the Black Wednesday wall tonight, I am stepping in for the wonderful Shannon Jackson, Assistant Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design or A&D, who usually welcomes community members and humanities 20 students to this gathering. Shannon is still with us on the call and is happy to field any questions if need be. Since this might be the first time some of you have joined the Monday series, let me tell you that this is co-curated by a range of departments and centers on campus, including the Department of Art Practice, the College of Environmental Design, the Berkeley Center of New Media, the Arts of Advocates of Berkeley Law, the Department of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies, Cal Performances, the Graduate School of Journalism, and more. Together, these groups alighted upon this year's theme of Together, Reinventing Politics, Reimagining Health, to galvanize a shared exploration for our campus, our community, and for a wider network of kindred spirits around the world. It is a theme that is all too important for a campus like ours that is undergoing its own process of institutional redefinition, including a process that reckons with the fraught history of the land on which we gather, even if we do so virtually this evening. UC Berkeley is sited on the unceded ancestral land of the Ohlone people. In acknowledging the Ohlone history of this land, 
We acknowledge that the Ohlone people are thriving members of the Berkeley community who are also reimagining what it means to be together and what new conceptions of health and politics are needed to do that imaginative, imaginative work. In light of this ongoing exploration, we welcome you tonight to a parallel and necessary conversation about the history and future of our campus space. That is the space known as the Black Wednesday Wall, or depending on what generation you are here, the just the Black Community Wall. As director of the African American Student Development Office, I am pleased to be hosting this gathering with Berkeley Arts and Design. I am also pleased to introduce you to my co-moderator tonight, Mia Settles Tidwell, Assistant Vice Chancellor, Chief of Staff for the Division of Equity and Inclusion and Campus Leader. And I'm now going to hand it off to Mia, who's gonna introduce our panelists for tonight that you're gonna get a chance to hear from. Mia, I hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Takia. I'm super excited to be here this evening with everyone um, to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart and to share this um, stage with um, Takia Jackson, who is an extraordinary leader um, that I follow and I know many of you do as well. I have the great honor and pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists for tonight. Um, we have with us uh, Cheryl Wright, who is the president of our Black Alumni Association, Cal alum, as well as a project management consultant. We also have Kwame Patton, John Kwame Patton, who I got a chance to be at Cal with, um, UC Berkeley alum, uh, former staff, and our historian, and also DJ Kwame. We have with us Lachelle Blakemore, Cal alum, and also our Associate Vice Chancellor of University Development and Alumni Relations, an amazing uh, leader. So thank you, Lachelle, for joining us tonight. We have Brian McGee, who um, is a Cal alum, um, former student athlete. When I was a Cal cheerleader, Brian was playing football on the football field and winning many games. So welcome, Brian, tonight. We also have Dr. Lee Rayford, who is the associate professor um, in the Department of African American Studies, also the inaugural director of the Black Studies Collaboratory um, here at Berkeley. And we're so happy to have Dr. Rayford with us. We have one member of the dream team, um, Melissa Charles, assistant director of the African American Student Development Office in the Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center with us tonight. So welcome Melissa as well. We have Cheetah Bay Okoro, who is one of our UC Berkeley most recent alums of 2020, and also the former African American Student Development Office staff leader, as well as working with the Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center. We have Dominic Williams, who's also a UC Berkeley alum of 2019, former student triad leader, part of the original triad request for the public uh, the Black Public Arts on campus, and currently the staff services analyst in the Secretary of State's office advocating for the underserved on many levels at the state. So thank you, Dominic, for being here. And rounding us out, we have Nanette Coleman, a UC Berkeley PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology, founder and executive director of Night Out, Night Off, and an incredible advocate as well. So we have a very distinguished panel tonight, and we're looking forward to hearing from them. And with that, I get a chance to turn the next part of our um, agenda over to Takia Jackson, progress on the Black Wall. Thank you so much, Mia, and thank you panelists for uh, being a part of this wonderful experience tonight. So I just wanted to share a little progress on the Black Wednesday Wall. This is a really exciting project that's happening. And if you joined us this fall at the Berkeley of Arts and Design series, we talked about the plans for the Black Community Wall, the Black Wednesday Wall, and what we wanted to do. And at that point, we were thinking about a project around the wall itself with the incorporation of the Pan-African flag colors. And so we were really excited to really um, look at that wall and reclaim the wall and do something with the wall. But after further conversation with uh, campus experts and campus community members, 
we were thinking, um, frankly, too small. <laughs> and so we are reimagining the wall because the area that the community has been gathering in for the last 40 years, plus the black community, um, has been much larger than the wall. It's the wall, it's the, uh, the, the space walking up to the wall, it's the ground that we walk on, it's the back wall, it's the whole area. And so now we're really thinking about how we can take that whole area and make it essentially a city that would be on our campus, something that you could walk through campus and you could immediately recognize, wow, this is a special place. This is a place you know, that represents and celebrates a certain group, and that is the Black community. And so we're rethinking what that means and what that looks like. We definitely have some ideas, but the purpose of tonight is for us together to reimagine how special a Black public art space can be on our campus and all the things that it should include to really capture the memories of all the people that were there and to hold that sacred space um, as a space that will hold those memories forever and continue to build the memories and be a special place for the Black community. So we're really excited to share that with you. Um, what we're about to do next, we're gonna queue up a video that I was able to shoot. Uh, I'm, not, I'm by no means an actress or a professional, but I did uh, want to share a little bit of the wall with you for those of you who don't have a visual. And so what we're going to do next is uh, show a video of the wall and, and that'll give you an idea of what we want to do there and what it looks like so that you can think about what we should include there. So Paris, uh, when you're ready, uh, you can share the video. My name is Takiya Jackson, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of African American Student Development at Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center. Thank you for joining me today for this special occasion. I am here to show you a very special area for the Black community, for the UC Berkeley community, for Black alumni everywhere. The Black Community Wall, also known as Black Wednesday Wall. I want to show you a little bit about it and tell you why it's special. So let's go over here and check it out. Now this wall may just look like a wall. But there's a lot of history in this wall. In fact, for over 40 years, the black community has been gathering here almost every day to come together, to build community, to have sacred space, and to just take a break. Back in the 80s, when there was 12% black uh, community members, they used to come to the wall every single day. And you can see pictures to this day of them standing on the wall and just having a good time, taking pictures, you know, having a good time, maybe sitting on the wall with friends sometimes facing this way, sometimes facing the other way. And this is something that they would do every day. Um, now we have something called Black Wednesday where students aren't here every day, but every Wednesday at noon, there's a program here for the black community and the whole black community gathers here at this wall and they sit along this wall, fill the wall up, and then we have a lot of different activities that we do. So it's a really, really, really special place. right here, the ground that I'm walking on is also a really special place to the Black Wednesday wall activities and the Black Community wall activities. This is the space where everything goes down, meaning the community gets together on any given day that you're here and we're at the Black Wednesday wall or the Black Community wall. You can see community members gather here. You may see a resource fair for different Black student organizations or staff organizations. You may see us dancing. We have our own dance called the Berkeley Shuffle. It's really fun. It's like the Cupid Shuffle, but a little more difficult, but we do it all together. You may see a fraternity or sorority stepping and different groups dancing. And you may see us holding hands together, seeing a community prayer or blessing together. So there's so many things you may see in this area, but it's a really important area because we take up the whole area when we're here in the back. This area over here where you see these plants is where we set up our booth. We have a booth every time that we're out here. We have a DJ, we have music, we have tables, we have food, we have resources, um, and we have contests. You're gonna hear about our contests and some of the events that we're gonna have um, that are coming up. Talk about the Black Public Arts project that we're going to do in this space, which is going to be really, really 
special. It's going to be a huge project, so of course we have to do it in phases because there's some significant things that we need to do before we get to the larger art project. Now, it may seem really simple, but let me show you over here one of the first phases of our project. These are the bike racks. The important thing to know about these bike racks is they did not always live here. In fact, they just got here in the last 10 years. And again, the black wall has been here for the, the last 40 or more years. And so we've learned that these bike racks actually obstruct our ability sometimes to fully enjoy Black Wednesday or the Black Community event. And um, these are something that we know that we need to remove to reclaim the wall. And so phase one of our project is actually to remove these bike racks and then replace them in a different part of campus close to here that is going to be um, accessible but also make Black Wednesday wall accessible to our community as well. So this is phase one. Now the next phase, almost happening simultaneously with the bike racks though, is these posts. It seems like they're just a simple light post, but we're actually going to mark the area with banners to let you know that you are now entering a sacred space, a special space, a, a place that's really important to the black community. So you will see banners on the surrounding poles of this area that mark the space as essentially a new city that you're walking into, something to um, you know pay attention to, to honor, uh, and to, to respect and um, to celebrate. We are also planning to do something with the ground. When you're doing a Black Public Arts project, I learned that it's not just one piece or two pieces, but it's the whole area that we want to memorialize. So we're going to do something with the ground that captures the spirit of the Black community and celebrates the Black community. And then of course, the next space that we want to think about is this back wall back here. And so we don't know what we're going to do yet, but it's going to be something beautiful again. There's plenty of space to um, do something amazing on this back wall. And then beyond that, we're even looking at, if you look back here where the plants are, <laughs> and it's somewhat, of, it could be a garden, we're looking at that space as well as that back wall, which has some beautiful textures that we can play with for an arch project. So we're really excited to just use all of this space. That is a summary of the Black Public Arts Project, but we're excited to talk to everyone more about it, and we're excited for this to be a really special place when it's done, and to come back and show you again. So thank you for joining me, and please support the Black Public Arts Project at UC Berkeley. Thank you for joining us for that, and now we're going to hand it off to Mia to talk to our panelists. Awesome, thank you Takia. You have so many talents. Uh, next talent is doing commercials, I love it. So we're gonna start off with some questions for um, our panelists. Um, and we'll start with Cheryl, Lachelle, Brian, and Kwame. They'll each have about two minutes to answer each question. And let's start with Cheryl for the first question. So you are a Cal alum and you now serve as the president for the Black Alumni Association. The wall has been a part of the Black student experience for decades, as you know. So what years were you at Cal and what was the wall like when you were at Cal? Thank you, Mia. Um, I'm so excited to be here. So thank you everyone for joining us. So as you know, I'm Cheryl Wright and I'm originally from Sacramento. I graduated from Hiram Johnson High School in 1978. And from there I attended Sac State for two years and then was accepted to Berkeley in 1980. I started UC Berkeley fall 1980 and I graduated May 1983. And yes, this was during the quarter system years. My high school, North Sac State, did not necessarily set me up for success at Cal, but it was the black community overall that supported me while I was there. For example, the wall is representative of so much more than a physical concrete barrier. barrier. It represented black community. During the past two and a half years, as the Black Alumni Association president, I wanted to connect with the students and that's how I learned that it is now called Black Wednesday. But back in the day, it was the wall at 12 noon every day. And as a student meeting at the wall at noon each day represented community. But more importantly, it represented Black excellence. Picture this as a young Black girl who grows up in Sacramento 
to later as a teenager be amongst scholars and professors who were absolutely amazing in Berkeley, California. We didn't know we were amazing back then. We simply were being together to share what we knew, which class to take, who was hiring. Yes, this was long before the internet. So some of you may even remember that in Sproul Hall, they had index cards that represented the names of students who were currently enrolled at Cal at the time. So meeting at the wall was where we shared information. We got our food in the cafeteria behind the wall where the workers were all black and proudly gave us a little extra fries in support of us as black students. We ate lunch together. We grabbed a dollar pizza and Coke from Blondie's. We watched the Kappas and the Deltas and all the Divine Nine on that wall. Picture Black Excellence, a group of students congregating at or near the wall, laughing, talking, telling jokes, looking at the brother with the big fro and the sister with the four inch heels, making it up the hill to class later that day. Those scholars would later turn out to be excellence in their own right. For example, the first black cheerleader at Cal, Sint Marshall, who is now CEO of the Dallas Mavericks NBA team, she was on the wall. Trina Thompson, this bad sister from Vallejo, who not only went to Cal as an undergraduate, but later defied the odds and was accepted at Boat Law School, which is now Berkeley Law where she obtained her JD. She's now called Judge Trina Thompson at the Alameda County Superior Court. Back then, athletes also congregated at the wall. Quite frankly, I was reminded by Ahmad Anderson about the history of the wall. He said it was he and a group of student athletes who were responsible, responsible for starting the whole concept of congregating on the wall at noon. Ahmad, a walk-on football player from Richmond, later worked at Cal as an academic advisor to help support the pipeline of Black students at Cal. We had Ralph Deloach, who went on to play for the Dallas Cowboys. He was on the wall along with Larry Cowling, a track and field standout and competitive in the Olympics as a hurdler. Black excellence was represented by Pedro Nagara, who was one of the finest TAs from Nicaragua. I didn't even know where Nicaragua was before I saw him. But Pedro is now the Dean of the University of Southern California, Rosier, uh, Rossier School of Education. On the wall, we saw scholars such as Dr. Harry Edwards, Dr. Barbara Christian, and other black faculty who were there to cultivate our black excellence. We kicked it with Desmond Carson, who is now Dr. Desmond Carson, an emergency medical physician. While I was sitting at the wall, I saw the very first black Jew young man pledge Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity on campus, Dr. Benjamin Gold, who's now a pediatric gastroenterologist. Again, the wall is so much more than a concrete block near Sprawl Hall. It's representative of the black community and its excellence at Cal and throughout the world. Thank you. Wow, Cheryl, amazing, you know, to hear what was going on in the early 80s and all of the networking that was going on, but also the showcasing of Black excellence um, in multiple ways. So thank you so much for that. I think the next question will, I'll pick on Lachelle. So Lachelle, you are a Cal alum and you currently serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor of Development on campus. What years were you at Cal and what special memories do you have at the wall when you attended? Um, thank you, Mia, and it's good to be here tonight. I, um, Cheryl, you, you covered so many highlights and I'll try not to uh, repeat, but I think that you're gonna see some common threads in what we all have to offer because the wall just represents heart. Um, I came to Berkeley in 1985 as a transfer student. Um, I studied sociology with um, Harry Edwards and so many other amazing faculty. Um, and as a transfer student, I did not live on campus. And so I didn't have a home base and the wall was the home base. And um, as Cheryl said, you know, that's where you went to meet up with your, with your friends to hear about um, 
job opportunities. I got a job as a, as a peer advisor in the what was then the EOP Affirmative Action Office um, and met some of my best friends to this day. Um, I heard about um, opportunities to be involved um, in the community as a tutor um, at the wall, as a summer counselor through uh, with CalCOR. Um, I met some of my um, best friends and sorority sisters at the wall. It was already mentioned about the step shows um, on Fridays, which was a, definitely a nice way to end the week. You heard about parties for the weekend. Um, you had the opportunity to also um, be with folks that could hold you up and lift you up. And when you didn't do so well on a midterm, or had bad news from the from home, you knew where you could go to get support and love and support each other. Um, and I think that um, for me, looking forward, you know, I would really hope that we can keep that sense of community and family and the sense of sacred space on campus. Um, this is much more, as Cheryl said, than a concrete um, part of the entrance of campus. And I think it's also situated um, in, a, in a place that is accessible. Um, it's not up in some corner of the campus that folks can't get to. It is right there on Sproul Plaza. And it, it, to me, it is, um, I think of it as the heart um, of my Cal um, experience. And so, um, I am excited to hear about some of the other ideas um, and um, just really happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. I mean, I'm sitting with the heart of the Black Cal experience. I like that quote. And um, both you and Cheryl said some really key words like community and home base. So that's very, very important to hold as we think about the, the sacred parts of um, the Black Public Art Project and the wall. So Brian, you attended Cal, we were there together and you were a student athlete, which is a whole different perspective. We know that student athlete schedules make it difficult to fully participate in community events. So what years were you at Cal and did you have a chance to spend time at the wall? And if so, what was that like for you? Thank you, Mia, and uh, good evening everybody. Uh, Brian McGee, that's me, you guys. So I got to Cal summer of 1985 through Summer Bridge. I was a student athlete and coming from West Oakland, California, it just felt like being at the wall is like the epicenter of Africa for my people. And I just felt uh, uh, a sense of togetherness, belonging. Uh, there was a sense of uh, you had the athletes, you had the fraternity and sororities, and then you also had our regular black students. You know, and for the athlete, we were limited in terms of our socialization with everyone else because we had to check in for a moment on the wall. And by one o'clock, we had to be at Memorial Stadium getting ready for practice. And so we missed out on a lot of the step shows. You know, we got a piece of it, but then we hear about them. We hear about how much fun it was and how much people showed up. And when the kid mentioned 12%, it was a sense of blackness. It was a sense of home, away from home. And so for me coming from Oakland and then being in that space and meeting people from all over the state of California and all over the country, it was just great to, to check in with folks and see what was going on for the week. And then um, there was a lot of folks during that time, like Kevin Johnson, who played in the NBA, I had a chance, had a chance to hang out with him. And Sheila Hudson, who ran track, you know, uh, back then it was just, you saw folks and they, was, they were this genuine and authentic, but for the athlete, we were just limited on, uh, in terms of getting the whole wall experience. But um, it was great. I enjoyed it. I stayed one year in the dorms, met on the black floor, room 417. I remember that. <laughs> and so it was a great experience. I loved it. And then uh, lifelong relationships from that point on and uh, very excited to be a part of the black excellence here at Cal and on the wall. Awesome, I have a, a, another part of the question for you because 
in your recent work, you brought high school students to uh, Black Wednesday. And so we would love to know what was that like for you and for your high school students? Yes, uh, I did bring a couple of students, a group of students from McClymouth High School in West Oakland to, to Cal. And then we went right to the wall on uh, Wall Wednesday, Black Wednesday. And the kids really enjoyed the music, the culture, the connection, the engagement. Um, they was excited to know the history that I was sharing with them. I uh, forgot to mention at Lower Sproul, they had percussionists and bongos happening throughout the, uh, the weekend. And you felt a sense of culture, like, man, I'm taking them back to my motherland. And they would go on and on for hours and through the night. And they shared that. And then they had a chance to see the campus, uh, Southern Gate, you know, Donnell Hall, just walking through the campus and getting a sense of the, the environment. But the wall itself, I shared with them everything that went on there. And they were really excited about it. They had a chance to dance with the current students. They had some dance, uh, uh, some battles, dance battles with the college students and laughed and hugged. And it was great, great experience for them. Thank you so much. So that could be one of our draws for more students, um, black students to come to Cal when they have these types of connecting experiences. So thank you for creating that. You're welcome. All right, Kwame, rounding it out with you. So you are a Cal alum and you've served the community as a staff leader for 20 years on campus. That's huge, that's an accomplishment. And we consider you our, our historian. So <laughs> what years were you here as a student? What was it like being here at that time? And what did the wall do to impact your experience? Hey, big up, Mia, class of 92. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you know, I got a bone to pick with the wall. Everybody's been saying positive things about the wall. The wall is responsible for my 2.0. <laughs> I had the first two semesters. So, you know, coming out of Crenshaw and during our time, Mia, I don't know what Berkeley did, but there was a bunch of students from New York during our time who were on campus and then a lot of people from L.A. And so we're used to that stoop culture, porch culture, being outside. And, you know, people from our areas love to watch people walk by. So that's what the wall represented for, for me. I spent too much time on the wall. Cause you know, you see right there, Lower Sproul became like a, a, a main intersection of all these people almost every hour when classes are changing. And uh, I, you know, I missed a lot of classes. So it was like a pit stop for me. Uh, I stayed in Clark Kerr my, my freshman year. So it was a long ways away. And so I could meet all my friends. I could do everything. The wall was just one of those pit stops. And it was a, a safe spot where you know you're gonna see somebody that you know you needed to see. Uh, and I was I was at Cal the the golden years. You know we were uh, class of '92, came in '88. Our incoming class is the second largest incoming class of of African Americans in the history of UC Berkeley since 1868. Uh, incoming class '87 is the largest incoming class, and so uh, I'm happy to be a part of that history. And you know I just want to put it on the record. Howard was my first choice, but they didn't give me fin financial aid. And so during our time, I felt like Berkeley was like a black Howard. You know, we, we had our own Howard on the campus. That's how much was going on on the campus during that time. And the wall played a huge role in all the happenings from the, the step shows on most Fridays to uh, just, just meeting up. Uh, all the all the different events that would happen at the fountain. And so it was just a great, great feeling. I mean, I feel you so much, Kwame. I tell you, I got on academic probation because I was one of those people watchers and I was majoring in husband one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> and at the same time, the wall was also the reason why I got off academic probation because of all the information that was given to me to build me up. So I dig definitely it. did both. So I really appreciate you bringing that memory back. I have a couple more questions for you. So as the black student population declined, which you know, we both were part of the heyday when we were one of the largest classes in 87 and 88, but the wall was less populated, you know, during the time of Prop 209 and, and we now have Black Wednesday and it was implemented to kind of formalize gatherings at the wall. So as a staff member, what differences did you notice at the wall as the black student population declined? Uh, 
that things became much more intentional and pronounced. So in our time, I would say I took the wall for granted. I never thought about the wall. I don't know if we named it. I don't know what we called it. I don't know if we said, I'll meet you at the wall. There was just so many Black people. We just looked up and we were either in Moffitt or the RSF or the Bears Lair on Lower Sproul or the wall where we just showed up. And so once that change started to happen, especially after 99, I was the undergraduate advisor in Afro from 95 to 99. And so I know Black Wednesdays, it, it had to start after 99 because I didn't really see that during my, my watch. And so everything became very pronounced, uh, programming and stuff like that. It, it had to be very intentional. Whereas our time, we just were at the wall all the time. We didn't need a Wednesday. We didn't need to plan events because it was just our spot. We just kind of dominated that area. So that, that, that's how I saw it. That's right. Thank you so much for always keeping it real. I love it. And so I'm gonna turn this portion over to Takia to speak with the rest of our panel. Thank you so much, Mia, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, I think what's important to notice here is that there was a really um, strong impact of the, the student percentage decline. I mean, going from 12% to 3% really impacted the way that students experience the wall. So we hope that one day we can get back to the point where the wall is somewhere that we go every single day and, um, and that we have 12% again. So let's talk to some students that were there uh, post 99. <laughs> and I'm gonna start with um, Dominic Williams. UC Berkeley alumni, recent alumni 2019 as uh, Mia, formally introduced. Uh, what's important to know about Dominic is uh, Dominic was a former triad student leader, which is a student leadership bo uh, body on campus that meets with the chancellor and the campus administrators to transform the campus in ways that are going to support the Black community. Um, Dominic, you recently gradu graduated and you were a leader in advocating for Black public arts on this campus. Uh, really, we're having this conversation because I remember being at a triad meeting with you and you brought this up and said that we need to have Black public arts on our campus. So what led you and the triad to push for Black public arts on our campus? And what will a Black public arts space at the wall mean to you? Yes, uh, thank you, Takia. And first, I want to know, uh, Cheryl, I think we grew up in like similar neighborhoods. I went to Valley High School in Sacramento and Hiram Johnson is, was the league that we, we, we played against uh, Hiram Johnson in our, in our basketball league. So that's one. And two, I just want to acknowledge that there are, there's a lot of love for Muhammad Ali in this, uh, in this Zoom today. I've seen Muhammad Ali in like three, and I think someone just noted it. Uh, there's a Muhammad Ali, Ali picture in like three of the four different panelists so far. So I just want to note that as well. Yes, my name is Dominic and uh, yeah, I currently work for the Secretary of State um, as a staff services analyst, uh, our first black Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Nash Weber. And to answer the question, um, at that time, you know, there was so much happening that it just compelled, I mean, we were, we were always, you know, as, as, as members of the BSU at that time, we were always uh, enmeshed in, in, in a bunch of different issues that were happening on campus and off. I mean, a lot of the organizing that we were doing was based off of things that were happening in 2018. In 2018, a couple of things happened. One was a USC report named uh, UC Berkeley the worst UC for black students, particularly uh, black students uh, amongst all the UCs. So that was one thing that basically verified something that we already knew at that time because we had already seen our numbers dwindle post Prop 209. Stefan Clark was someone that was killed in, in, in a neighborhood that I went to birthday parties as a kid in Sacramento. So that was something, you know, and there were ongoing issues regarding police and police violence that was happening at that time. And just, you know, all these culminating issues that were happening. And so, you know, the BSU, uh, BRRC and AASD, which are the three entities that make up the triad, the triad uh, met with the chancellor. We had our 10 demands. And one of the demands that stuck was that we want a black monument at our campus. Something that you could run into is what I would commonly say, right? Because we, we needed that presence. We needed that 
we needed that there for us. Um, you know, three years later, the continued advocacy of Takia, Mia, uh, Shannon, Kirby Lynch, and others, um, we've, we've been able to arrive at the Black Wednesday wall, the wall. And what it means for us, the investment of UC Berkeley into reimagining the Black wall, the, the Black Wednesday wall, the wall, it's an acknowledgement of our struggle. It's an acknowledgement of our pain, but it's also an acknowledgement of our resilience, our ability to find joy in the midst of so much turmoil. So, you know, I'm calling on, and I, I, I appreciate this work that Takia and others have, have continued to lead. And, you know, I'm calling on UC Berkeley to honor its rhetoric, honor its rhetoric and, and what it says it is, right? And, and prioritize this, this artwork and support this community in its, uh, in its search for some, some acknowledgement, some, some piece of us that we can see and say, that's, that's for us. And that's, that's, the, that's what we draw ourselves towards. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. And again, thank you for, um, you know, putting that on the table, because again, we are here having the conversation about the space because of you. And so of course we had to talk to you today. <laughs> so continued success to you and the work that you're doing. We don't have time to get into it, but you also were really um, influential in, a, in some different props that were on the ballot this year as well. So that will be another conversation <laughs> that we'll reach out to, but you all keep your eyes on Dominic doing some really big things in the state and really impacting uh, well beyond our campus. So thanks Dominic. Um, next, I'm going to have Melissa Charles, who's the Assistant Director of African American Student Development and Campus Leader, Community Organizer, just uh, a person of all types of talents to join us on the screen. Um, and Melissa, I want to ask you some questions because you're really involved with the wall. So uh, as the Assistant Director of AASD, you facilitated a process for the Black community to be intentional about the impacts of Black Wednesday. Why was it important to have official weekly programming at the Black Wednesday Wall for you? And how have you seen that programming impact the community? Thank you, Takia and everyone for putting this together. Um, I really like this question and I'm just sitting here like soaking in all the alumni's responses. Um, and it makes me think even more about like, I know Kwame mentioned that he feels like he took the wall for for granted and i'm sitting here like that's kind of my goal with this with these students is is to create a space where it doesn't have to feel so intentional um yeah because i think a lot of times i've gotten to witness so i i graduated college in like 2012 um so i kind of got to experience like some peak years of where my university we had a good amount of black students and then like my last two years, right, was kind of what, what our students are experiencing now with the not having a lot of Black folks on campus and there being a really heightened experience of visualized like racism in the, in the, in the world and um, yeah, not really seeing yourself represented on campus and feeling like your university is letting you down in some ways. Um, so, so getting to kind of see both of those pieces I know how the students now are feeling and, and a lot of times it's just community and they spend so much time having to focus on racism or what is to be the only black person in a class or whatever it may be and so I felt like it was really important um, in all of our work to be able to create spaces where students can just be um, and not need to feel like they're thinking about you know the, the, the latest police murder or they're thinking about being the best black person in their major class but that they're just being able to like exist um so yeah it's been it's been really amazing getting to see that um because students our students are just people like they some of them are introverts right some of them need a structured facilitated experience to be able to build community and make friends with people some are more extroverted some like to dance some don't like to dance like at the end of the day, like they're just human beings. And I really like the idea that a space can create that where they're just like, oh yeah, like I'm just gonna be a person. And I'm just like a first year, 18 year old kid who like is coming to college and wanting to make friends and find community. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I feel. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you for your leadership. Um, I know you work directly with the student leaders in the community a lot. And, and uh, Black Wednesday is staying alive um, <laughs> because of your vision and continued work. So um, we're really excited to, to see everything that you hope for come to life. All right, so now let's talk to one of the student leaders um, that worked closely with Melissa before she graduated, Chidabe Okoro. And Chidabe recently graduated. We miss her already. <laughs> um, so Chidabe, I wanna ask you some questions since you were really instrumental in um, thinking about the programs at the Black Wednesday Wall. And so you were staff leader, you led Black Wednesdays every week, so what are some of the programs that you put on and what programs were your favorites um, for the community? Okay, great question. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, well, first, I just want to like piggyback up what Kwame said about missing class <laughs> and going to Black Winds or going to the wall to hang out with folks. When I was a freshman, it was kind of like kind of like the for me what I see like the the climax of like seeing a decline in people wanting to go to Black Wednesday but freshman year I remember um it was public health 116 I would miss it almost every Wednesday because <laughs> there was always something organically happening in that space and I just wanted to be a part of it and take a break um academically so um joining the Fannie Lee Hammer Black Resource Center as a staff member and um, being in, like being one of the people who was in charge of like facilitating Black Wednesday, my ultimate goal or dream was to have an inclusive space where people can come and feel relaxed and decompress, get information and just be able to experience Black joy um, because I think um, the campus has a way of suppressing suppressing people's um, joy or like it, it just makes you feel like like you're trying so much and is it all worth it but seeing people who look like you laughing and just having a good time when you're on campus is just like it's a relief and I think it's a great way especially because it's in the middle of the week um, to to complete the rest of your school week. Um, I think the most impactful program that was had that people still talk about uh, was in uh, 2019, September 11th, we had like a do-rag day. And I think it was the most colorful I've ever seen um, the front of the GBC. Like everyone had some type of scarf, a uh, do-rag, um, folks had hijabs and it was just a great time um, to just be free and liberated and just embrace your blackness and see everyone around you just feel so comfortable in their own skin. Um, and so many people got to participate. Um, another event that I loved was, um, we had a bi bisexual awareness Wednesday uh, where you just have to wear purple in solidarity, so that was great. I think giving out free um, ICs to folks um, during Black History Month was really great because a lot of people showed up, a lot of athletes came who usually don't get to be in the space. And so it really helped to um, broadcast to everyone that this is a space for you and you're welcome here anytime. To a point where some days in the week, I would see people congregating in that space if any, it wasn't even Wednesday. So it was, I think it's a great, having intentional programming is a great way to like stimulate students to like start using the space even when you don't necessarily have to. Thank you so much, Shida Bay, um, for your vision. Um, I remember participating in the do-rag contest for waves and I'm still a little upset that I didn't place higher because I did have a lot of waves <laughs> that day. Um, but I, I do appreciate you creating space for us to feel authentic because I don't know that any black people ever feel comfortable wearing their do-rag because of the stigma and the judgment around it. So that day I felt free to walk around in my wave cap with my waves. And so again, um, we appreciate what you got started and we will, we promise to keep it going. 
So, and we'll call on you for ideas moving forward. <laughs> I'm open. All right, thank you so much. Okay, now we're going to move to Nanette Coleman, who is a UC Berkeley PhD candidate but um, also been involved in the Black Public Arts uh, through a program called Night Out, Night Off for Graduate Students of Color. And so uh, we wanted to talk to, to Nanette with the graduate lens and also um, to someone who's also promoting Black arts in the community. And so Nanette, thank you for joining us. And I wanna ask you, um, what would a Black Public Arts project mean to the Black community, specifically the Black graduate student community at UC Berkeley. Thank you, Takia, and also uh, thank you to me. I, I greatly appreciate uh, being included in this, this, this phenomenal program. I, I think to set the context, it's important to realize that for graduate students, we when we arrive at, at Berkeley, we feel both tethered to our department and then also extremely untethered. Uh, so very often we, we don't get the chance to, to fully integrate with the larger community because there are just such exceptional requirements for our participation and attendance in our department. So when I found out about Black Wednesday, uh, when, I, when I found out about the amazing programming and, and uh, the people that look like me would be there, uh, it, it broke my heart on most Wednesdays when I was sitting in class staring at whoever was in front of the classroom talking about something that I couldn't be outside. Uh, so um, I, I, you know, I wish where I went to college had, had something like that. So I, 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 I think of myself as a, an accidental student advocate. So I, I arrived at Berkeley and, and like I think a lot of us became entrepreneurial because there were things that needed to get fixed. Uh, and those are the same things that probably needed to get fixed uh, when when uh, some of our uh, some of our uh, elder stateswomen and men on, on this call were here also. So uh, you know, I, I set to work uh, after walking into an arts venue on our campus. I, I founded Night Out Night Off for Graduate Students of Color because I attended an arts event at Cal Performances and and looked around and it was it was just me. And, and wherever I have uh, gone to school, wherever I have lived, Washington DC, Boston, Buffalo, first thing I do is I, I find out where the arts venues are. I find out where I can see beautiful black people on stage, dancing, singing, performing. So much of our history is rich in arts and culture and I want to see that. And I walked in and I'm looking around, you know, I'm from New York. So I'm like, look, I'm like, where are the black people? You know, like, and, and, and it, I, I came to realize very quickly that there was a, um, it was hard for people to cross the threshold there. And it, for me, it, it became down to things like folks asking me, well, you know, is this your first time coming to an arts event or um, are, are you even a graduate student? You have a graduate ID, but you seem a little old. Uh, I'm 42. Uh, you seem a little old, you know. So, you know, there's already so many um, hurdles uh, to to engagement uh, in, in a place where we're in such the minority. Uh, but but. It, it just felt like there, there was something that could be done that would make this space more welcoming. So in 2016, founded this organization and we started going in mass uh, to, to events. Like, so, you know, we rolled deep at the opera, at the ballet, took 125 people to go see uh, Hamilton um, and, and we subsidized that. So we are not paying more than between five and $30. Yes, I said $30 for Hamilton. Uh, and, and, and I am under no illusion um, that after we leave some of these spaces that prioritize uh, the white gaze and, and, and the European canon, uh, that we have, have ultimately moved the bar uh, substantially. But after we go there five times, we might. Um, after um, after our, our, our presence becomes, uh, you know, I, I, I like to bring, you know, black and brown faces into, into spaces that we're not always uh, traditionally seen. And uh, I, I, I developed a passion um, for the arts at a, at a young age and, and at Cal, it, it became a way to wash away my responsibility temporarily. So being a mentor, representing things, you know, people in my department taking my photo, putting me in things, you know, have, having to represent what I'm just trying to be. Uh, so I wanted to build a space where um, my classmates could have that too. So for a few hours, we could engage with an art form we loved or a new art form we hadn't seen before and just wash everything off. So you take a night out and a night off and you're just you, you just get to be. And, um, you know, I was under no illusion uh, about the type of experience that I might have at Berkeley. I, I was told when I, I think there are 1300 PhD students and at the time uh, I entered only a hundred were black. Uh, so I could go weeks, days without seeing another uh, black PhD student. And this is a way to, to enter into those spaces and see people. 
And, you know, I, I, I wanted to build a space and a, and a, and a, and a place for us to, to relax. And I think an investment in uh, not just the wall, uh, and in 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 not just uh, the the wall behind it, uh, but in the in the entire area. And you know, I'm a dreamer. I'm looking at the Golden Bear Cafe over there, going, "Huh, what could we do with that?" Um, you know, it, an investment, uh, not as Dominic said, not just you know rhetoric, but actual investment means that the spaces that we occupy won't be temporary. So that you know, if the budget changes, or or in the case of 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 my academic home, the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. Uh, you know, building starts falling apart. It, it doesn't mean that our community is cast out. So investing in that space means that every time I walk by, even if it's two in the morning, I'll know that I have a place. Um, and I think in, in, the, in this moment, graduate students, undergrad staff, faculty, we all need that because our existence is constantly challenged. Yes. That's the whole word. Thank you so much. I, I am with you on all of that. And thank you so much with your leadership uh, with the Black graduate students. As we know, um, that's a population that we don't talk about enough, but we know that that's a very isolating experience and that, uh, you know, implementing the arts into the, the experience can definitely help you take a breather. And we hope to incorporate the needs, you know, of, of graduate students at the wall too. That's why we wanted to have your voice in today. So thank you so much. Okay, now we are going to invite Dr. Lee Rayford, who is a professor in the Department of African American Studies um, and, and was introduced earlier as the inaugural director of the Black Studies Collaboratory uh, to share some words with us um, around the Black public arts. So Professor Rayford, you've done a lot of work around Black public arts and Black arts on and off campus. And as someone in the field, why are Black public arts spaces so important and what will it mean to see them on our campus. Thanks, Takia. Thank you, Takia and Mia, and just all of the panelists. And I mean, the you know the lively chat that's happening. Um, this is I feel like I'm at the wall, even if I'm you know <laughs> we're in on Zoom. Um, this has been really phenomenal, and I'm just really pleased to be here. Um, I'm so just floored also by, I feel like all I wanna do is just um, amplify what other folks have said, right? About the work that the wall is doing, right? So, um, well, let me back up and just say that, um, you know, most basically like public art and monuments specifically um, are to quote the folks at Monument Lab um, in Philadelphia are, are statements of power and presence in public, right? Um, and I think that so much of what everyone has said really underscores that, right? Whether it's Cheryl talking about the wall as um, a site of community and the cultivation of black excellence, um, Lachelle saying that, you know, the wall was a home base and a place of support and love. Brian talking about the wall as a kind of, well, it's a place of belonging, but also I kind of think you and Kwame were referring to like a, as a kind of um, diasporic meeting ground, right? Whether that diaspora is, you know, um, NorCal, SoCal, or East Coast, West Coast, or beyond the U.S., um, the safe spot, the place of where you know joy and resilience and struggle, and I think all of that is so clearly um, part of what we hope public art will do, right? That it will provide a space um, where people can feel a sense of belonging and a sense of their power. Um, often in locations where they they don't, um, you know, where they're marginalized. Um, Rodney Leone, um, who is um, an internationally recognized architect um, and designer of the African burial ground in New York City, talked about the principles of what public art and monument should do. He talked about cultural continuity, spirituality, um, a site that should be a place where people can go for education, for communication, uh, for spirituality and universalism. Um, it should also be interactive and participatory um, and a space for reflection. And this is, you know, I think the wall, the wall is already doing all of those things. And so, so much of the, I think that the importance is to concretize that. Um, as Nanette said, right, to make sure that these kinds of the, the efforts of it um, outlast, you know, 
you know, the students, your time here as a student or, you know, my time here as a faculty member or, you know, Melissa and me as time here at, and to as, time, as, as staff people, right? Um, and I think that's all so important. Um, the only thing I, I want to issue a kind of cautionary tale um, or, you know, a, a warning about the limits of public art. Um, and I think we all, we all know this to be kind of true, right? If the, the goal of the wall is to commemorate and celebrate a black space on a campus that has long been a hostile environment um, for black students and faculty and staff, um, that has, you know, as Dominic pointed out, especially in the transition um, in the post-209 um, era. Um, and so we want the black wall space to be, as you put it, to a city, right? And people to know that they've entered into a kind of sacred and important ground. Um, but at the same time, we also want, we want that for the whole of the campus, right? We want the campus to address the systemic in, um, inequities and inequalities, the loss of black uh, numbers of black students, the low graduation rates, um, the feelings, you know, the, the, the hyper-policing um, by UCPD. Um, on campus. So we want, we want this space to be, to, it has to, to be a living, con offer a living context, right? I mean, I think for me, um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time necessarily at the wall. I feel, um, let me, how do I want to put it? I, I feel myself a little bit of a policing presence because I'm, you know, I'm like, should I hold class at the wall? Like, what's happening that people are, are not <laughs> showing up to class? But, um, but I also recognize um, that, you know, we need the wall to, to hold on. Um, when I did show up the wall, it was often for protests. Um, and so thinking about also the importance of that space um, as a living container for all of our demands um, and ongoing the ongoing pressure we always will have to put on the institution. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that, Professor Rayford, and uh, give us a lot to think about as we continue to move forward. Um, and again, hoping that this is a starting point, um, you know, for what we expect the campus to do in the transformation and, and support in, uh, of the Black community. So we will be in touch with you. You are not just a panelist, we are a partner <laughs> because we would love to hear more of your thoughts. So thank you so much. Um, for just your wisdom and knowledge on that. Um, and I'm gonna hand it off to Mia, who is going to uh, move us into our dream session. So Mia, handing it off. Thank you so much, Takia. Now, as we know in the black tradition, call and response is very important. Sometimes we have limitations through the online, but what we're gonna do is I'm going to provide a prompt, a visioning prompt um, that the attendees can put their vision in the chat and the panelists can definitely uh, use the chat as well as speak freely to the prompt um, just unmuting yourself and so the visioning exercise um i want you to think back to the the video that takia um presented earlier and thinking of all, all of the spaces from the wall to the light post to the walkway, to the back wall, to those planters. Think about the entire space and think about the Black Public Art Project as many projects. This is one of many to infiltrate the campus with um, Black art. So the Black Public Art Project will be located in front of that Golden Bear Cafe where the Black community has gathered for decades. Okay, now I want you to close your eyes. And I want us to dream together of what the space would look like once it's finished. What would you want to see in the space? So again, we're dreaming. There are no limits to the dream. We're thinking about the space. We're thinking about the words that we heard from the panelists. We're thinking about words in our heart that we've experienced ourselves, selves with the black wall. And now we're going to begin to write in the chat and speak freely from the panelists about the vision. What would you like to see in that finished space? What would it look like? 
the first thing that comes to mind for me and um who was it someone earlier oh Nanette earlier was saying like mm, what can we do with GBC and I want to see a commemoration of the folks who got me my job um the 2015 Black Student Union who in 2014 following the murder of Mike Brown um shut down the Golden Bear Cafe for four and a half hours um and really catapulted what it would what would lead to us having our Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center, having our dream team, um, having you know this panel and this conversation today. Um, so something there, some monument, whether it's their demands, the Ferguson to Cal hashtag, or low key, I'm kind of like, can we get a statue of them just like standing in front of the door? Um, but yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that, Melissa, because Y'all asking me to dream now. So what I was thinking is essentially a photo mosaic of all the Black folks that have sweated for the UC Berkeley campus, have cried on this UC Berkeley campus, have worked, skipped class, do anything, you know, be involved in, in, in uh, student leadership and BSU, all these things, right? Anyone that has had to commit to UC Berkeley outside of their classes, any struggle to make this campus better should get a photo of themselves on the wall, on the, on the ground, around the wall, uh, on GBC, you know, front, give us the bricks. Yes. Like I'm thinking like, I'm already, there's so many organizers, so many black students that have had to sacrifice so much just to exist freely on campus. Ife Chuku, Kirby Lynch, Blake, AB, Kendall Dow, Kyra Abrams, Takia, Melissa, Elias Hennett, David C. Turner, Ahmad Mahmoud. Like these are folks that I've had conversations with at some point or some, or I've heard about them. Like these are people that have, man, they have stressed out trying to make this campus better and no one asked them to do it. No one asked them to do it. They just knew they had to. Right. So what I would like to see amongst, you know, obviously a, a colorful, inviting space is acknowledgement of all these people. Exactly. And, you know, put, put your names in there. We'll, we'll write a list. Right. Uh, but anyway, a, a, a commemoration of all these folks by having their actual picture or a picture of them doing their work as part of this wall. That's what I would like to see. And uh, yeah. I wanted to add that, um, and I appreciate that, Dominic, of what you're saying, um, because for me, we also had elders that were Black faculty um, and staff. And as I said um, before, even a cafeteria worker <laughs> who gave me extra fries because they never imagined that their children would go to Cal. So they were just so pleased to see me there. But I think a representation of faculty, you know, um, so the Harry Edwards, there were, uh, I, I'm seasoned, so I forget some of the names, but there were some folks who uh, actually helped pave the way for us. Um, so I'm gonna consider myself an elder that I think we need to um, keep in mind um, when we were marching. So there's the Regina Jackson who is, um, the president of East Oakland Youth Development and she and I as students uh, were marching, you know, as it relates to divestiture uh, for uh, from South Africa. So it, it can be, I, I've been thinking of uh, moving um, photos. I'm not really sure because I'm not a, um, you know, an, an artist, but a, a collection of different things that we could probably get from each other that could depict the rich history of what has gone on through the generations at Cal. I would, oops. sorry, it's hard to know when, when to talk. I don't want to <laughs> over, talk over anyone, but um, as we're talking about like photos, I think it'd be really cool to have, um, I don't know if you've seen like, kind of like a picture mosaic where it has all these pictures that come into one larger image 
I feel like that would be an incredible way to encompass all the faces at once. And kind of like a Where's Waldo situation where it's like you have, anytime you come and look at this space, you're seeing a different face and there's a different history. And like the way technology is going, you know, you could take, if we have like those coded squares and you take a picture, a whole like, it will populate the history of like what this space is because Black Wednesday is not only a social, epicenter for black students it's a political statement so many things have happened in that space and also that is like the prime real estate for black students to recruit other black students into campus it's the first thing you see in Sproul Hall and it's so significant and I definitely agree on like a walk of a Hollywood star situation where it's just like names like it should just be so visually overwhelming like that you're just like wow I have to stay here for hours just to understand everything that's happening here because so many students staff faculty have really shed blood sweat and tears for this institution but not for like Cal but for each other and so I, I would really want to see a space where as an alumni I can come back and show other students like no matter what you're going through, just come to this space and ground yourself because it's never going anywhere. Like this is something we created and no one can take it from us. Um, I would like to share as well the wall. Um, I came out my last year, 89 in social welfare and as a student athlete, it has to be something on that wall that represents the black athlete as well. And shout out to Ahmad Anderson, who did so much for me when he was uh, a counselor there. He worked there in letters of college letters and science. He was like my mentor, made sure that I was on track to graduate, making sure that he can identify as a black man, as, a, as an athlete, as well as a faculty on campus where he impacted hundreds of black athletes that played at Cal. And so somewhere it has to be something, you know, that memorable for that black athlete walking through that campus you know a sense of brotherhood and and also uh togetherness because people don't realize the commitment it takes to juggle being a student athlete on that campus you sacrifice so much of your time and your family and your loved ones just to uh to get hit to get you know physically and mentally drained you know out there and at the end of the day you still want to be able to excel academically as a student and so being on that wall would represent not only hundreds and hundreds of black students on campus, as well as uh, the young women as well, who also spent a lot of time doing it, doing that time as well. So uh, my Anderson brother, shout out to you. You've done a lot. And also Nate Carroll, Grace Massey, black family. She's she, you got to be remembered. And uh, it's just great to have that on the wall. Thank you so much. Oh, awesome. Keep the visioning coming. It's beautiful. I'm looking at all the responses in the chat and making sure we take notes of what the panelists are saying. So keep it generative and keep it coming. I'm just going to add, I, really, oh, sorry. I'll just go. I just want to add really quickly that um, one of the things that Cheetah Bay did at the Black Wednesday wall was to create belonging within the Black community. And what I mean by that is it was a very um, African diasporic representation of Black Wednesday. So I remember one of my favorite events was when the Nigerian Student Association took over and they were, you know, showing um, us about their culture and dances and just different, um, different groups throughout the African diaspora. So a way that we can capture that. And I think that's why we were thinking about the Pan-African flag being represented throughout the space or, or at least the colors, um, because our community is just so diverse and so beautiful and we want to capture everyone so I don't know exactly what that looks like but to remember to bring some of that that in I'm right now I, I'm picturing the the Nigerian flag in my head because they always dance with it when they come to um you know Black Wednesday and just show us how to dance and I can't do it but um I'm just picturing that flag in there too yeah we I'm should. just gonna jump in and oops who was that I just want to say we definitely need some type of flag <laughs> and a big flagpole. 
I was just going to jump in and, and, and echo the, the sentiments I've heard and, and also mention that I think a performing arts space, uh, a space that at any point we can say, we want to bring in a speaker or we want to do this, that we're not uh, beholden to the, the timelines of, of anyone else and anyone else's priority. So that if in a moment of, of upheaval in the country, we decide that this person needs to come and speak to us, we can do that. Um, I, I've, I've had the occasion and the opportunity at, at, the, at the height of their um, uh, at the height of their popularity to, to bring the, some of the cast from Hamilton to our to our campus and could not find a venue and they were going to come for free. Um, and and that's not a, a one time thing. Uh, so so I, I think that we need uh, a, an innovative space that we can use for whatever we need, whenever we need to do it, I think would be quite, quite powerful. I did not know we almost had a cast of Hamilton on our campus multiple times and we could not do that. That's just, I have to uplift that. Berkeley is messing up. But I also wanna uplift something that uh, Chita Bay has said, and I'm glad Chita Bay and I are on, on, on the same wavelength here. Um, you know, addressing the, the, you know, what, what this will mean for the recruitment, the retention, um, the, the attractiveness of Cal for our student body and our, uh, potential student body, right? Like if we're able to literally depict, if we're able to literally make the students of, of the black students of Cal part of our campus, literally by making sure that they're, and this is me, I'm still endorsing the idea that Chide Wei and I have, have uplifted, making them literally part of the campus by putting them on the wall, on the ground, on GBC, you know, that entire space, right? I don't think there's much more of a way to um, encourage uh, black students to come to Cal other than saying, you can literally see yourself on the campus. like. In, in, in many ways, right? In, in a very literal sense, you can see yourself in your community on the campus, on the ground, on the wall, right? So um, I definitely wanna uplift that as well, that the ability for us to um, attract students who, as has been lifted uh, by Professor Rayford, a historically hostile campus, a campus that has not always wanted them here and has demonstrated that. Um, I, I feel as if there's no, no better way. Um, yeah, so I have two things. Um, one is a little more real um, and the other is just something that I think I would love to see. Um, but I think with the, with the construction of whatever is happening, I think I'd also like to see like, hmm, not, this isn't really a material item so much as it is what the ongoing support from campus looks like around maintenance of the space and maintaining the integrity and the like sanctity of the space. Um, just knowing as Taki and I have worked in black specific spaces on campus and you know folks don't always like when those spaces are created. Um, and so really, really would like to have additionally a plan um, from administration around what does the upkeep of the space look like and how are we making sure that nothing that happens there might cause harm to, to our larger campus community um, and, and not have to maybe try to navigate certain bureaucracies around that. Um, and then on a brighter note, I want a dance floor. Um, it doesn't have to be like formal, but I'm more so just thinking, you know, if we're doing sculptures and different things and bricks, um, like I feel like, I. I, I just feel like the space needs to be left open um, for, for our dance competitions, for our jump rope days, for our hula hoop days, for our wave check Wednesdays, for our karaoke days. Like we need to, we need to be able to move. Um, so, and if that could be memorialized, like I'm thinking more creatively, like if the bricks could be laid in a way that like makes up a dance floor, a Pan-African dance floor perhaps, it would be lit, it would be lit. 
The other thing I was thinking of is that Dominic um, talked about students seeing themselves there, um, uh, prospective students. I think that having a space where alumni who were there want to come back is also an important thing to consider because there are some alumni who have not had good experiences and to have a space that is you know, representative of us, I think is a huge step for not only students, but alumni as well. I wanted to add that um, I think it's important that we have some type of community guidelines or some type of plaque like that, because I would hate for all this work and labor to be done for the space to be co-opted. Um, and so I think it's really important to be very intentional about that space, because I I've experienced, um, I think it was when there was like a free speech week, the first, the first time they did the free speech week, um, a lot of white supremacists on campus gathered upon that place and we received no protection from anyone. And they actually cleared out the whole of Sproul because there was a secondary issue about a bomb threat in MLK, but they didn't want to tell us, so we're outside between white supremacists, police that are not doing anything, and then a group of allies who are trying to protect us, and we're dancing and listening to music. So I think that like this space is so important and whatever work that's done around it, the, the institution needs to be behind it and they can't leave us in the wind um, because at the end of the day, we're not only students, we, are your lifeline. We are the reason you have Black students here without the alumni on this panel and other people who are not here today. I wouldn't have gone to Cal. I wouldn't have stayed and I wouldn't have graduated. So I think it's very important that even if our dreams sound so wild, they need to be done because it's the very least, the very least you could do as an institution. This is so powerful, so awesome. I love the imagination, the innovation, the passion um, from the actual visible things, concrete things on the space to the intentionality of how to operationalize it, how to keep it going, but also how to protect it. So, so thank you all. Thank you all in the chat as well. Any last comments before I turn it over to Takia for some few last words? Hey, thank you panel. Thank you attendees for joining us in this visioning session and exercise. It was really generative and it was powerful. So thank you. Takia. Yes, thank you so much. And I just uh, want to appreciate the attendees. We know that um, a lot of you that are out, um, you know, in the crowd, if you will, uh, could also have been panelists. And, and we would love to expand this conversation moving forward, of course. But um, thank you for your chat contributions. I saw someone put in there um, that we should, in the middle of um, some of the photos, put a mirror so that students can see themselves reflected, somehow build that into there, and then they see themselves. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities. Um, and I don't think that we really have parameters. So that's why we're trying to dream big. Um, of course, dreaming big may cost big. So that's the next thing is, you know, let's um, be intentional about uh, creating some excitement and black joy around this. And I think that this is one of the steps to doing that. And I think there is a lot of interest in doing this. And so um, we're just so excited to, you know, have something that I, I'm not a Berkeley alum. I'm kind of jealous right now because uh, I don't know that my school is doing anything like this, but best believe when we finish, I'm going to be talking to them. Um, but, you know, as an alum where, you know, Cheryl, your class can come back and be like, look at, there's me, there's my star, you know, and Mia's like, oh, there's my star, you know, like, and people are seeing like, oh, there's a picture of the BSU and, you know, just different things that people are going to capture and, oh, there's a dance floor and, you know, here's where we're going to have you know, speakers come. So it's really exciting. Um, and this is why we wanted to have this conversation because I think all of us together, we are one, right? And so um, this has just been really wonderful. I also want to thank um, Shannon Jackson and her team and the Berkeley Arts and Designs team for bringing us back a second time 
um, to talk about this. And also for those of you who don't know this, um, after Dominic you know, said that we need a black public art space. Shannon Jackson actually led the black public arts group in convening and helped us talk about this. And as we said earlier, this is not uh, a, a standalone project. This is the beginning. Uh, the goal is that black public art will be represented at every corner of the campus in the middle, everywhere you look, you can't help but to see us <laughs> and we can't help but to see ourselves reflected. Um, and, and Shannon has some really awesome um, projects also that are not just public arts, but you know, um, a lot of interactive education. Um, you know, we have a, a project with uh, Black News that we're thinking of doing with Khalil Joseph. And so uh, I just really want to shout out Shannon. She's not on the screen, um, but is an integral part of this work and, and very supportive in the work that we're doing. Um, and just uh, sending love to all of you that are the panelists that are out in the crowd, for those of you who couldn't make it, for those of you that we didn't know about, we love you and we apologize because I know some people are gonna be like, well, I was the one who did this and this and we're learning, right? And that's part of us opening the legacy and making um, an opportunity to learn more because I think we all learned a lot today. So um, just wanted to thank everyone and I'm gonna let Mia share any final words um, before we close out. Thank you so much. Wow, this was a wonderful way to spend an evening. Um, one with Black excellence, two to just really have our hearts filled with some of the memories, the joy, the inspiration for building a future for our future students, but also inviting our alumni back. I just wanna leave you with just certain words that just stood out to me that I wrote down. Um, so things like, heart of the black um, experience, the epicenter of belonging, African belonging, a safe space, um, an acknowledgement of our struggle, our pain, our resilience, our joy, creating a space that feels normal, that this is everyday life, this is the way it should be a place that's going to bring in more students, recruit, that they can see themselves. Full integration, a home away from home, concretizing our efforts, monuments as statements of power, presence, and belonging. The diasporic experience, a meeting ground. We have envisioned this together and we are people who make things happen. So now that we put it out in the atmosphere, we look forward to seeing it be a reality. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Takia, thank you, Shannon, thank you, panelists and attendees, this was awesome. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, huge, huge. Thank you, Greg, thank you.